uh, detection of uh, drones. Uh, speaker is uh, uh, Simon Bernbach, and uh, he is a uh, first-year PhD student at the University of Oxford. Hi, my name is Simon Bernbach, and I'm here today to talk to you about uh, detecting privacy invasion attacks by consumer drones. This is joint work with Richard Baker and Ivan Martinovich from the University of Oxford. Okay, let's talk about drones. When I'm referring to drones, I mean a small rotorcraft, such as the pictured uh, DJI Phantom. Um, these uh, drones have the ability to fly and self-stabilize, which means that they give a great deal of freedom of movement for the, for the user. Um, they are conveniently controlled using uh, smartphones and tablets, and the mounted uh, camera equipment on the drones allows it to take pictures from an aerial viewpoint. With drones becoming cheaper and more widely available, this uh, model, for example, costs just $399. Um, with cheaper models being available, they become an appealing pastime for many people. But the reasons that make drones popular also carry dangers when in the wrong hands. Drones are able to ignore physical access restrictions such as fences or walls, and the high quality camera equipment mounted on a drone essentially means that they become spy tools in the hands of everybody, and all that for just a couple of hundred bucks. bucks. Um, this means that now nosy neighbors are not limited to peeking over the fence, but they can actually fly over it to um, get to a window and look straight through it. This means that privacy invasion attacks, such as the one pictured below, where the drone flies up to a window to look through it, are getting more and more common a trend that is likely to continue in the future. So, how can we now detect if our neighbor is spying on us? The state of the art of drone detection uh, has several approaches. For example, cameras can be used to visually detect uh, drones. However, uh, they tend to struggle distinguishing birds from drones. It is therefore often suggested to um, additionally use ac acoustic cameras uh, or microphone arrays to pick up the uh, rotor sounds uh, of drones. Um, but unfortunately, the cheapest such system made out of low-cost components that we could find in related work still costs about $4,000. Another option is to use high-frequency radars, why they tend to be even more expensive. Uh, as you can see, uh, to use these approaches, expensive and specialized hardware is um, needed. This means that uh, these, op these uh, approaches are hardly viable for the general public. Our goal was it therefore to design a cheap detection system um, that can be implemented on uh, consumer hardware. In our work, we focused on using the communication between the drone and the controller to detect drones. Um, the idea is that eventually uh, the user will be able to just install an app on their phone that is able to tell them when drones are nearby. So, but who are we actually uh, defending against? I said earlier that we're worried that an, a casual attacker such as an, our neighbor um, wants to spy on us. Such an attacker uh, is likely to use an unmodified commercially available drone. These uh, types of drones are typically controlled over Wi-Fi and they also provide live video data uh, that is streamed over the same Wi-Fi channel to facilitate steering of the drone. The objective of the uh, attacker is to capture video through a window, which means that he has to um, establish line of sight at some point during the attack. We further assume that the attacker doesn't have direct access to the premises, uh, is otherwise they could just walk up to the window anyway. This means, as pictured uh, on the slide, the attacker has to launch from some distance away and move towards the window. The general idea of our detection uh, is to use an off-the-shelf Wi-Fi receiver um, that is able to pick up the Wi-Fi signal of the communication between drone and controller. We place the uh, Wi-Fi receiver in a window because this uh, guarantees us line of sight to the attacker at some point during the attack, as mentioned before. Furthermore, we have access restrictions in place that force the attacker to start the drone from some distance away and also force them to fly higher to overcome set access restrictions. Um, we are now facing several challenges. Because we're using standard Wi-Fi receivers, we are limited to using the received signal strength. 
as more advanced uh, measurements such as general state information are typically not available. Unfortunately, RSS is known to be very noisy, which is something we have to deal with. Uh, but we will actually use drone characteristic RSS changes uh, to detect the drone. Furthermore, we don't know the flight behavior of the drone in advance, and we want to detect the drone early enough to deploy countermeasures. Um, countermeasures could, for example, be um, automatically shutting the window blinds to foil the attack. Um, now to the system itself. Uh, we first have a pre-processing phase where we separate uh, different flows of interest. Then we use some statistical test to decide if a drone is nearby and thus establishing the presence of a drone. When we, when we have uh, labeled a flow as belonging to a drone, we can then decide if actually an attack is being carried out. We do this by dividing uh, the attack in uh, three different phases. The approach, the, th the surveillance phase where the drone is actually collecting data, and finally the escape. Additionally, we want to warn the user by giving a proximity alert when the drone is getting dangerously close to the window. We will now briefly cover the pre-processing phase. Uh, we are using uh, the MAC addresses to uh, separate different flows, and we prioritize uh, flows with a high throughput, as uh, live video streams typically have a high data rate. Once we can look at individual flows, we will then use statistical tests to decide if, if uh, it's shown characteristic RSS changes are present. But what are those uh, characteristics of drones? I said that the attacker has to overcome physical access restrictions, which means uh, they have to fly reasonably high above ground. Additionally, they have to establish line of sight to the window, which means that we expect uh, that the drone has far less, is far less susceptible to multipath effects due to a strong direct line of sight component compared to ground-based transmitters. Additionally, the drone is moving towards the window, which means that we expect the signal strength to increase as the drone approaches. Um, together, we propose this as our detection method, method uh, by using these two tests. We test for flying by checking if um, the signal behaves close to a, an idealized tree space propagation model, um, which is something we wouldn't expect non-flying transmitters to do. Uh, the second test is a test for movement, where we check if significant RSS changes occur as the distance to the receiver varies. We'll now look at these tests in a bit more detail. Um, if, the, if the signal behaves to a free space propagation model, the RSS only depends on the distance and the noise at the receiver. Um, if we measure the RSS in a short enough time frame, we will only see variation in noise if, as the drone can't move far enough to affect the signal. For the movement, on the other hand, we um, expect larger variations in longer time frames uh, as the drone changes the distance to the receiver. We can measure these uh, changes in RSS by computing the standard deviation of the, the RSS measurements and comparing them against the noise threshold uh, that we can derive from noise at the back, background noise at the receiver. If you put these two together, we can detect a drone if the standard deviation is below a noise threshold in short time frames and if, st if it stays above a noise threshold for longer time frames. Uh, let's look at this at, a, at an example. In this uh, figure, you can see a simulation of, a, of the drone signal during an attack. On the x-axis, you can see the time during the attack, and on the y-axis, you can see the standard deviation of the drone signal. The uh, black horizontal line uh, is, visualizes the noise threshold. We can then test if the drone is flying by checking uh, the standard deviation, if the standard deviation stays below the noise threshold in a short time frame, in this case, 72.5 milliseconds. Uh, then we can test if it, uh, the uh, standard deviation exceeds the noise threshold in larger intervals. We need several time frames for this because we have to account for different drone speeds as slower drones uh, get detected first from, uh, by, by larger uh, time frames. In this case, for example, the drone was first detected by the five-second window as compared to the one-second window. Now we have established that the drone is present. We want to now uh, determine if it is actually approaching us. 
to do this, we monitor increases in the difference of subsequent RSS measurements. We can furthermore uh, establish a threshold on this RSS difference to detect if the drone is getting dangerously close to us. Um, in conclusion, our system tells us if, if a drone is nearby, if it is approaching, and if it is getting dangerously close to our window. We, um, we tested uh, our system in an experiment which we executed in a secluded farmhouse in the English countryside. We had to do this in a secluded setting as it is illegal in the UK to fly drones with camera equipment within 50 meters of um, other people or houses. The drones we used for this experiment were the DJI Phantom 3 standard, which is pictured on the left, and the Parrot Beep Bebop on the picture uh, right beside it. As a receiver, we used a Raspberry Pi with a Wi-Fi stick that we mounted in a window, which amounted to a total cost of $40, which means that we met our requirements for cheap uh, and available consumer hardware. Um, we then wanted to check if our system meets the challenges we set us in the beginning. To do this, we tested um, our system against four approach patterns, for which we did three runs uh, of the experiments each. The first one is just a straight approach, which we expect to be the normal behavior of an attacker. We then also tested a zigzag approach as a more erratic approach with a sideways movement. The back and forth approach that we used uh, stands in for an approach where the drone is not constantly approaching the, the window. And finally, we looked at how our system is affected if the drone only comes into line of sight very late. We also wanted to see how early we were able to detect the drones, which is why we um, recorded GPS traces of the attack and synchronized them to our detection system. Let's see how this works in an example of the straight approach. Again, we have the time during the attack on the x-axis and the standard deviation of the signal strength on the y-axis. The two series in this uh, plot are our two statistical tests. The red series is the uh, free space propagation test to see if we are dealing with a flying transmitter with a window size of 100 milliseconds. The blue series is the movement test <coughs> with a larger window size of 15 seconds. Um, again, the black horizontal line is the noise threshold. You can see that in the beginning, the free space propagation test mostly stays below the threshold, and that the movement test exceeds uh, the threshold at various points. The first peak of the movement test is when the drone is being launched, which means that our uh, system detected the drone uh, already on the first few meters after launch. The subsequent peaks are then occur when the drone is further approaching the window until it finally reached the window to start the surveillance. Notice that the free space propagation uh, test variation increases as the drone gets closer to the window as we then will get stronger multipath components in our signal. And uh, furthermore, due to the closeness to the receiver, small changes result in a, in a larger variation. But it is uh, in, sufficient for our system to detect the drone during the approach together with the proximity alert that tells us when the drone is getting close and to tell us when it finally escapes. Um, now let's look at uh, the detection distances. Here you can see the distance from the receiver during an attack. We launch with uh, various approach patterns. We launch the drone uh, from about 60 meters afar in all cases. And you can see that the uh, red part of the bar is the part where the drone remained undetected. It is notable that um, the drone was uh, detected earlier for the zigzag approach which happens because the zigzag approach has a lot of movement that isn't directed towards the window. The back and forth approaches and straight approaches um, have similar detection distances because we detected the drone during the first forward movement of the back and forth approach. Um, the furthest the drone got towards the window in our experiment was in the third back and forth approach where the drone reached a distance of 48 meters before we detected it. I excluded the non-line of sight approaches from this uh, figure because we uh, essentially detected the drone already during the, um, 
the ascent immediately following launch. Uh, we were surprised by how, uh, how good we detected uh, the drones in the non-line of sight case, but we expect this to heavily depend on the structure and building material of the house. Um, in conclusion, we developed a method to detect drone privacy invasions, and we implemented it on cheap hardware. In the future, we want to um, also implement this on phones, which is something we are currently working on, so that the user can just leave their phone on the windowsill and be alerted of, dro of uh, nearby uh, drones. We uh, did a real-world experiment with a variety of approach patterns to show feasibility of our live detection system, and we want to uh, explore further uh, environments in the future. Our experiment uh, showed a good performance with a minimal detection distance of 48 meters when launched from about 60 meters afar. With this, I want to conclude my talk. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions.